that the makeup artist, the person who gets that bare essential, as I said before, gets the canvas, the model's face, and they will then draw on that face and they will paint it to however the, the look of the whole shoot is going to look. Obviously the hair, the makeup, the stylist, the photographer, they're all going for one goal. They all want that one picture to have a certain look and to look a certain way. I think there are a lot of girls who would like to be supermodels. It's not as easy as it seems. It's not as glamorous as it seems. It doesn't happen overnight. The model has to work in various different countries with lots of different magazines, with lots of different photographers to actually make it. it is, it's a five to six day week, so they have to have the stamina, they have to be able to communicate with people. Every time they go on an appointment, it's like an interview, it's like an audition. And some people, even though they may have the looks, they haven't got the confidence or the ability to do it. And the thing is, it's not like you or I going to a job. They have to go to a job and they have to look great all the time. And I think that is why there are so few international superstars. I think when you look at a picture in a magazine, look at it and appreciate it for what it is, but look at it and think about all the work that's gone behind that picture. The hair, the makeup, the styling, the photographer, the idea, where's the idea come from? Think about all those things that really go into making the picture and I think maybe you'll look at it in a different light. There's more modelling to modelling than just a pretty face and though you might have that certain X factor, there's a whole team of people who can equally turn you from a beauty into a beast. I'm sorry, that's not hopefully you're told you. Are you sure? It has been said that it's the greatest car of all time. It's economical, it's very pretty, and since the 60s when it became the car of the trendies, it's never looked back. cars were the hit of this year's motor show, with many big car manufacturers launching their version of the small car, but none more popular than this one, the Mini. Over 5 million Minis have been sold since its launch in 1959, and in all that time its looks have hardly changed at all. So why in an industry where design is constantly changing has the Mini survived? Well where better to find out than here? at the Heritage Motor Centre in Gaden. This is the largest purpose-designed motor museum in Great Britain with a fantastic collection of over 200 classic cars. Designed in an Art Deco style, the building was only opened in June of this year. Peter, you've got a wonderful collection here. But sort of going back to the beginning, what was the original idea with the Mini? Well, it was primary to get as much into as small a space as possible. Really design a car that would fit into a small area and get as much inside. How important is the Mini in terms of car design? Well, it really is outstanding. It's one of the great designs, uh, international designs, uh, ever conceived for the motor car. If you think that virtually every small car, be it German, Japanese, Italian, French, are all based on the concept of the Mini. The front wheel drive, transverse engine, almost certainly that sort of concept. And they're all based on Isagonis' original design. So did he have many problems fitting all the parts into such a small space? It was the overall concept of the design, to package it in. Things, even the development of the small wheels and tyres capable of accepting the power uh, on such a small size, it really was quite revolutionary in its, idea, in its ideas. The Mini was a, a fun vehicle. Now the moment I've been looking forward to, putting the cars to the test. Launched in 1959, this was the very first Mini. No heater or radio, but a very good price at only £496. This is one of the Minis that won the famous Monte Carlo Rally. It was a winner three times in 1964, 65 and 67, which helped to increase its popularity. Moving into the 70s, Mini's popularity continued. The new model, Mini Clubman, was launched with its square front. 
In the 80s, Mini celebrated its 25th anniversary with a special Mini, painted which colour? Silver, of course. This must be one of the fastest Minis. With its turbocharged engine, it costs nearly 30 times the price of the original Mini. And right now, the Mini to be seen in is the Mini Cabriolet, the most luxurious Mini produced so far. Now that I've got the transport, there's one more place I want to get to. If all this talk of cars is making you wish that you could have a go too, well you can, but on one of these. Woo! With a trademark that is now recognised by 94% of the world's population, You'd have to go to the ends of the earth to find someone who hasn't tried Coca-Cola. But why has Coke always been the real thing? In 1886, John Pemberton, a pharmacist, invented the formula for a new drink and advertised it as the ideal brain tonic. Pemberton's bookkeeper, Frank Robinson, chose the name and put his handwriting skills to good use by coming up with a trademark we're all now familiar with. It started life as a syrup which had to be added to fizzy water. But in 1899, the rights to bottle the ready mix drink were bought for just one dollar and the business expanded all over America. However, to begin with, any old bottle was used and the identity of the company started to suffer. So, in 1916, a new bottle started to run off the production line. The shape was based on the coca bean. Its grooves inspired the rib design, which became known as the contour bottle. The shape became as familiar as the name, and together they not only began to influence our culture, they became a part of it. For example, at the turn of the century, there was no particular image associated with Santa Claus. That was until Coca-Cola came along. Their adverts, featuring a warm and friendly Santa dressed in their company colours, were so strong that Father Christmas has been pictured that way ever since. With nothing left to prove, Coca-Cola went back to the drawing board in the 60s and introduced the can as part of their packaging range. But the contour bottle still influenced its design. It was decided that the shape of the bottle would live on in the form of the dynamic contour curve that was added to the trademark. And recently, the new range of plastic bottles have taken on the shape of the original, which is now 80 years old. It's a shape that has made Coke one of the strongest symbols of the 20th century and is perhaps the best example of how important the right design can be. They say on days like this, here on Portland Beach in St Ives, you can sometimes find a mystical horse in the sand. The problem is, I haven't got much time to find it, because I'm up against the elements. Sam is quite a good medium to work with. It's not as hard as you may think. I usually start with the head first. It gives you a good sense of proportion for uh, doing the rest of the horse. The head usually has uh, the most detail, quite like uh, human faces. I mean, every horse has its own characteristic and distinctive features. I'm about three and a half hours into the horse now. 
you've got to make sure that the sand is very compressed when you're doing the stomach like this, otherwise it will just collapse. I've probably made between 250 to 300 sand horses over the years. And I've even taken sand horses to um, the Royal Festival Hall earlier this year. I mean, I took about seven tons of St. Ives sand and I had a ginormous sand pit inside the festival hall. And that was a lot of fun. As you've probably noticed, the, um, the tide is coming up uh, rather quickly. So I'm rushing against time to, get, to finish these hind legs. But it's looking quite dicey. So there you have it, the sand horse of St Ives. The thing I like most about sand horse sculpting is the fact you're always fighting the elements. You know you'll never win and the horse will always return to the sea. sad that the horse is now gone but then art doesn't have to be permanent it can be temporary too and anyway nothing lasts forever next time you're in a city or town center take a look around you in amongst the concrete and steel there just might be a work of art waiting to be discovered Louise, you've been taking some photographs, haven't you, in your city centre. What did you think of them? Well, we found a mural in our subway in Maidenhead, and there used to be lots of graffiti around there, so it's really tied it up, and I think it looks really nice. What about, what about the statue? Yeah, well, it's a, st a statue called Hope, and it's of a mother and child, and it, it's quite a modern statue. I quite like it. It's interesting. Now, Max, you've been looking at the London Underground. Yeah, especially <coughs> ones at Tottenham Court Road and Charing Cross, so, like the murals on the wall. And I think, obviously, if you're going to stop and look at them, they're sort of nice, but in every day, you just walk past them and don't really notice them. Well, I think, in a way, they're supposed to be more decorative, aren't they, than art? It's supposed to make the whole atmosphere, <laughs> Im improve the atmosphere. I suppose basically. so, yeah. And what about at Gatwick? That's another, uh, another place they've got this incredible sculpture. I think that's sort of like the, wa the waterfalls, really meant to sort of make you feel calm before you go onto the, the airplane. I think that's quite nice, actually. It's sort of a nice little touch. Now, Ollie, you've been at Liverpool Street Station. Yeah, right in front of Liverpool Street Station, there's um, a large structure basically made out of four or five sheets of steel and metal, um, which, like, just like that, is quite striking. It's um, made by an American artist, Richard Serra, um, and he hasn't treated the steel in any way, so gradually it's rusting, um, and so the piece is constantly evolving and then you realise that it's in stark contrast to all the other metal buildings around it. But it could be said that it's not particularly attractive no, to look at. No, I mean, I doubt anyone would say that it was attractive, but it's making a statement, and that's clearly the intention of the piece. Now, Layla, what about you? You've been... Yeah, I've been looking at a um, sculpture that was made in 1983, which is um, made out of rubber wheels made by David Mack, and it's made a submarine. And, well, he's got the shape of a submarine, but... I just think it's a waste of tyres, really. Do you? I think it looks great. I mean, people would certainly notice it. People would notice it, but I just don't think there's anything there. Well, in Birmingham, there's a, a public art commission agency which gets industry and artists together to create works of art for the community. And in particular, we've got the Sleeping Iron Giant here by Andrei Novikovsky. And it's absolutely it's wonderful, isn't it? It is. There's also the Iron Man by Anthony Gormley. I think that one's great. He looks sort of really <laughs> upright and straight. And then Tessa Jarry has been doing some fantastic work in Birmingham city centre here with her pavement art. I don't see the point of that. I mean, it's obviously lovely if you're looking at it from a bird's eye view. 
But if you're walking around, you just think, why are there so many different colours on the floor? Unless but maybe you don't see that particularly as art, but it would definitely, you could definitely say it improves the environment. Yeah, it does improve the environment a lot, yeah. Ollie, I think you've been looking at some more unusual pieces, haven't you? Um, I've been looking at the work of an artist called Rachel Whiteread, who won this year's Turner Prize. She's taken a terraced house, terraced house um, plastered the inside walls with concrete, and then demolished the house, leaving the concrete as a sort of negative of the inside. It just doesn't fit in. It's just like, if I was looking outside my house, I'd... I'd I think that's the intention. The intention is to, like, contrast the other houses in the area. And what about you, Sam? There are some other things that you've been looking at. Yeah, the Pont Neuf Bridge in Paris, which artist Christo has wrapped in 4,000 metres of material. This is my favourite, yeah, definitely. It lovely, looks fantastic. Lovely. I think it's brilliant. I think it's really striking. I don't see the point. Whatever way you look at it, it's still a bridge. I think it, it really makes something out of a bridge. It's not just a plain bridge. We have art right here on our doorstep because we've got the mural mm, painted nice. by Vicky Askew in 1991 for Going Live. I think it looks great yeah. and it certainly brightens up the building. And they always remember it when they come to the BBC. You see it as you're coming down the road, it's just there and it makes you think, oh, I'm here. So anyway, why not take a look at your city centre? It might just be the best art gallery in town. <laughs> Show business like no business I know. Everything about it is the a smell of the grease cake, the roar of the crowd. There is something magical about the world of theatre. Unlike videos or the cinema, every performance is a unique one off event. And there's the magic of the theatre itself. They are special places, full of atmosphere, energy and expectations. And grand ones like this make you feel like dressing up to match its golden gilt embossed splendour. London's West End is the heart of Theatreland and where it beats strongest. These days it's musicals that top the ticket sales and the Dominion is home to one of the biggest, brightest and brightest in town, Greece. It's the heart-melting, toe-tapping, foot-stomping story of star-crossed lovers Sandy and Danny. In 1978, the original stage version was made into a mega-hit movie. Could the magic of the theatre meet up to the million-dollar standards of the silver screen? A lot depended on the skill of the stage designer, Terry Parsons. The producer said, quite simply, we want the audience to join our grease party. Yeah. And that brief was given to myself, the director, the choreographer, and we took it from there. And I only had four weeks in which to actually design a physical production and then eight weeks to actually build it. So what I normally do is spend possibly a week quietly on my own, working away with bits of old matchbox and bits of old card, forming the shapes. Then I draw it up and then the team of model makers will come in and help me to create the actual finished result. Most of the straightforward scenes in the show come mostly out of the choreographer's wishes. I mean, the particular shape that you end up with would really be there to back up the dancing and the movement. But the style of the billboards is very much the style of the, of the design. Um, it's colourful or it's, it's black, but it's quick and it's slick and it's, it's over in a second. Money is, not, is only relevant that it's not wasted. You often find that a good producer will, will back you up with money if he thinks that the idea is worth going for. I like to take the audience that comes through the door and, and change their lives for that evening. Um, and if you do it right, you do it from the minute they sit in their seats to the minute they leave. And that's how you know you've got it right. Wow, it is amazing up here. During the performances, this is where all the action is, behind the scenes. It takes 23 people to keep the grease set up and running. It's hard work and needs to be done at speed. The longest changeover between sets takes quarter of an hour, and that's during the interval. Everything else must be done in a matter of seconds. Well, this is where the motor operator sits, and he's the person who's responsible for bringing on all the large pieces of scenery that are too big for the crew to be able to push on and off. And he's also the person who operates the revolving billboards you saw earlier. So what do the stars of Greece think of their sets? I think it captures the feeling of the 50s and 90s. And the sets are becoming more and more important, not just us, but like the Sunset Boulevard, Les Mis, Miss Saigon. The sets seem to be taken over, which is 
I suppose in a sense it's a shame really because people don't actually go out whistling the sex. If you have five-year-old kids coming to see the show, let's say, they might not understand a lot of the jokes. They might, you know, it's the visuals that they walk away with, which mm -hmm. really is like the choreography and the sets. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the music. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm all dressed up and about to take my seat for tonight's performance. All over London, every kind of show, actors and audiences are about to surrender themselves to the magic spell of the theatre. If you would like a fact sheet for any of the makes we've featured throughout the series, or if you have a make or design project that you would like us to film, Send a stamped addressed envelope to Artifacts, BBC TV, London, W36XZ. We loved it, particularly those films on the modelling at the start and the one on the grease. Very showbiz, excellent series. What a fine way to end now. A little bit of my Christmas music here in the broom cupboard because uh, there I was a couple of days ago asking, pleading for your help as to what to buy my parents. You know what it's like trying to buy your mum and dad a present? Every year it gets harder. Well, this was immediate response to television because as soon as I'd done that, Stacey Pitter from Bedford. Hi, Stacey. Yes, I got your facts. Thank you very much. She recommends for your dad an executive toy or a pair of socks. Boring, but thanks for your help. Grain chill still to come this afternoon, but now news round presented by our crash. The dinosaur eggs which could hold the secret to prehistoric life. And Christmas is celebrated for the last time on the Needles Lighthouse. Hello. Scientists in Scotland believe they've discovered two fossilised baby dinosaurs inside a clutch of ancient eggs. They say the find could provide valuable information on prehistoric life. The eggs are on show at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. For Newsround, Andrew Castle reports. The six eggs are 18 million years old and were brought back to Glasgow from the Chai Kong province in northwest China. But when scientists studied them closely, they noticed that two hadn't hatched, and they now believe the remains of the unborn dinosaurs are still inside, news which has already captured the imagination of visitors to the Hunterian Museum. Developing dinosaurs have been found elsewhere, but never before in Britain and never in eggs of this type belonging to the sauropods, the family of dinosaurs which include the Diplodocus, Apatosaurus and the Brachiosaurus. You know what this is? It's a dinosaur egg. If the scientists are right, it would be an exciting discovery, but unlike the movie makers, dinosaur experts in Glasgow, like Dr. Neil Clark, say there's no possibility